Okay, our next seminar is by Martin Vandenberg. He works for Sojeti. Uh, Martin is one of the leaders in the Sojeti Service Line Infrastructure Cloud Security Division, which provides end-to-end -end solutions in the IT infrastructure space. Services and solutions include technical implementation as well as strategy, process, architecture, and business aligned solutions. He specializes in design and implementation of business architectures and organizational strategies to proactively leverage IT for, for leap from business advantage. He has served with Sujeti for 18 years, 10 of which have been in the Netherlands. Martin's has, Martin has extensive experience in the consulting from, for global Fortune 500 companies. So if we could just have a round of applause to introduce Martin, please. I appreciate it. Thank you for that introduction. And that's quite a mouthful. Oh, that was me. I'm sorry. No technical issue. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to talk about seize the cloud today, uh, because we we really see what I, what we see with our clients is that they really need to to embrace the concept of cloud, which doesn't always happen yet. And and I mean, it's it's a mission that we're on. So uh, if you look at my LinkedIn profile, it says there my entire title and everything that I'm doing, but it also says cloud evangelist. And the reason for that is because it truly is bringing the good news to our clients of what cloud can do for them. So in the next 30, 35 minutes, I, uh, I hope to go through that and, and hope to clarify a couple of things. Uh, so first of all, uh, I am really thankful to be here. So thank you so much for the invitation, Julio. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. It's always a pleasure to be here, love OU. A little bit of uh, green bobcat blood running in the veins here. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. I really appreciate that. Uh, what we'll do, we'll go through introductions first, uh, because I work for Sujeti. And I don't know how many of you know Sujeti. OK, a couple of hands. That's actually not bad. That's pretty good. OK, so we'll, we'll introduce Sujeti, but I'll introduce myself. Uh, the, the story that we just heard is actually displayed here. So I'm Martin Vandenberg. I uh, work for Sujeti USA. Uh, been with the company for 18 years, which is uh, an eternity in today's day and age. Uh, 10 years of those was for our operations in the Netherlands, where I was born and raised, and eight years here for Sujeti in the USA. Uh, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, by the lake, and uh, I am responsible for infrastructure, cloud, and security in the region that consists of Cleveland, Columbus, Pittsburgh, Western Pennsylvania, and then Tampa and Tallahassee in Florida. That's a little weird. That's a little jump, right? But if you live in Cleveland, you understand why you need to have units in Florida. You need to be able to fly there when there's like a couple feet of snow in your driveway. So that's why I also do Tampa and, uh, and Tallahassee. Uh, there's also a business reason. Uh, here in Ohio, we actually do a lot of work with the state of Ohio. And the state of Florida in Tallahassee is also one of our big clients. So we have some synergies between those two clients. That's why we, uh, we have it too. But flying out in, in January is not a bad thing, trust me. Uh, if you look at Sujeti, so Sujeti is a very large international IT consultancy provider. So Sujeti is actually part of the Capgemini group. Uh, Capgemini group, more than 190,000 people worldwide, headquartered in Paris, France. And Sujeti is one of the labels that the Capgemini group has in the market. So there's two labels, the Capgemini label itself, and then Sujeti. Uh, so Jetty is what we call local touch global reach. And that means that consultants that work for Sujeti typically work in the region where they live. So we don't put people on airplanes every day. We don't fly them out to, to clients. Uh, I'm kind of the only one that has to do that to Florida. But we, we typically don't have to do that. They work and, and live in the same region. And that has all kinds of advantages for our consultants because they have a better uh, life-work balance but also for our clients, because we don't have to charge them those travel rates. So our rate structure is actually also a lot more attractive. Uh, we in the in Sujeti USA here, we are in more than 20 cities across the US. So I named a few here uh, in, the, in Columbus, uh, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and then Tallahassee and Tampa. We're also very big in Texas, but we are throughout the entire US. Uh, and we, we host typically Fortune 500 to 1,000 clients. Those, those are the clients that we, we count to our our targets, so to say. Uh, we have global delivery centers all across the world as well. So we have a very large contingent in India. If you look at 190,000, actually 90,000 of those are in our delivery centers offshore, being India, South America, and Eastern Europe. Uh, so uh, a lot of right shoring going on there where we help our clients on site, but also do business offshore with them. 
So Sugeti has also a, a very long-standing partnership with Ohio University. Uh, and both the Dutch operation, where I'm originally from, but also the operation here in the US. Uh, so the Dutch operation, uh, what we do in the Netherlands, we actually, so we hire college grads, like yourself, straight out of college. We give them what we call a boot camp. And part of the boot camp at Sugeti Netherlands is that we send our new hires to Ohio University for three weeks. So we put them on a plane, put them uh, here. We have a partnership with the College of Business and they actually go through a three-week business course with, with faculty from the College of Business. I mean, very, very interesting, and there's actually a group of them right here, right now. So if you hear some strange language on Court Street, it can be them, I mean, the Dutch, Amsterdam, they don't go out, right? So. But it could be them, it's possible, <laughs> it's all possible. Uh, but there's a, yeah, there's a group of about a tw 20 people here right now from the Netherlands, uh, new hires for Sugeti in the Netherlands. Uh, then Sugeti in the USA, we have a very big partnership here too. Uh, uh, I'm personally involved uh, with Professor Anderson and the College of Business in a program that we call OICP, the Ohio International Consultancy Program. And that's something where we, we over a period of eight to 10 weeks, we give uh, students that sign up for that a consultancy experience. We give them a project, we, we give them a business case, and they need to work things out. So very long standing partnership. and. Uh, I love coming back to campus here. So that's one of my hobbies, one of the things that I do. So let's dive into cloud a little bit more. So what is cloud? And uh, to answer that, we, should, we probably first should answer the question, why is it cloud, right? And why is it cloud and, and what is that thingy there? Uh, it really stems back to the time when uh, graphics were this crappy. Uh, and we, we were truly uh, trying, to, trying to say, okay, we, if we connect things over a wire, it probably is an internet in between, and let's make that a cloud. So people started drawing clouds on, on blackboards, and after that whiteboards. So it started out in blackboards even. And that's how the cloud uh, started to be uh, that symbol. And we still use that today, because compute on the internet is still cloud. That's why we call it cloud computing. That, that where, that's where it's coming from. Uh, so what is cloud computing? I mean, sometimes when I talk to clients, they say cloud computing is just someone else's server. And if you strip everything off, that is absolutely true. It is someone else's server. It's Microsoft server or Amazon server. It is somebody else's server. But it is so much more. It's all these things that you see around here. I mean, it is an API platform. That is what it is. So everything's connected. Everything's integrated. Uh, when you go to Amazon, you can get free database services or free business intelligence services. Uh, it's an, a completely integrated platform for everything that you desire and everything that you try to do in your own data center today. So it's much more than just somebody else's server. It's really, truly, it's a model and it's a, it's a thought strategy that you have and, and implement in your organization. Uh, if you kind of look at the, what the largest public cloud providers are, uh, and you see the logos right here, uh, Amazon is by far the largest uh, from a public cloud perspective. Microsoft's a very good second. And what's very interesting in this little lineup is that you see Salesforce there as well. And Salesforce is the only one that just focuses on what we typically call software as a service. It's a packaged solution. And the fact that they are in the top five with a package solution is actually unique and shows the capabilities and the things that where cloud computing <laughs> is going, right? Uh, the funny thing on this slide is that Microsoft, IBM, and Google, if you look at the revenue and you put that all together, they are still smaller than AWS. It's ridiculously massive what Amazon does in the cloud today. So uh, we all know that Amazon is a, is a huge company, I mean, Fortune 15. Uh, but the AWS part of Amazon by itself is already a Fortune 500 company. That's how large they are. And they're growing 30, 40% year over year. Uh, Microsoft, I would say, was a little later to the game. But last year, Microsoft doubled their Azure business. It just doubled 100% <coughs> growth in one year. And we're going to see that adoption. We're, we're going to see that over the next couple of years. We're going to see that explode even further as many of our clients uh, and many of the companies that you will be working for in the future are, are starting to dabble in the cloud and starting to migrate workloads and, and really start doing stuff. So it's, it's very exciting, exciting time for, uh, for cloud services. So what, if, what about this thing called private cloud? 
And we have the, the, these discussions with our clients as well. And I'm going to say something polarizing that some of you might not agree with, but I say that private cloud is not cloud. Uh, sure, you can have your own data center, and you can have an API layer on that, and you can have some of the functionality that you can get out of cloud services in, on the internet. You can emulate that. But ultimately, if you look at the entire package that you get from public cloud services, you cannot compare that with what you do in your own data center. So it's a very different approach. I'm not saying that there's not a model where you would use that approach, but private cloud is really a different kind of cloud. You're still in the business of buying hardware. You're still in the business of data center cooling. You're still in the business of floor space. And you're managing all this stuff. And, and if you go to the, to the true cloud, there's, there's all these models that you have, and those models are laid out on this next slide here. They're courtesy of Microsoft. So this is a comparison, and we'll share the slide deck, of course. This is a comparison between on-prem, infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service. And you see all these things here that are in that stack. And this is very rudimentary, because if you look at virtualization alone, for instance, we could split that out even further. There's, there's all kinds of things that are within virtualization. There's all kinds of things that are within middleware from an integration perspective. So this is, these are the building blocks. Uh, but I, I knew I had a presentation for students today, so instead of talking about boring stuff, I am going to talk about pizza services, because that resonates much better, right? And you can actually compare these four models with pizza services. If you do everything on-prem, that's making your pizza at home. You've got to do everything from scratch. You've got to bring the dining table, the soda, electric or gas, oven, fire, pizza dough, tomato sauce, toppings, and cheese. You've got to have all that stuff. Now we go to infrastructure as a service. We go one up. We dabble and we put our foot in the cloud. Infrastructure, great. All these green things here, the vendor manages that. You don't have to take care of that anymore. And that's a take and bake. You go to the supermarket, grab a DiGiorno, you put it in your oven. So you still need an oven and fire, electric, gas, soda, and dining table, but you don't need these other things anymore. It's all taken care of. No cheese, no toppings, no tomato sauce. It's great. Now pizza delivery is the next step. That's platform. A platform as a service is pizza delivery. You don't need your oven and fire anymore. All you need is a dining room table and soda, and you need to open the door when the delivery guy comes. And then ultimately software as a service, a package solution, everything included, that's going out to dinner at a pizza restaurant. So you go to an Italian restaurant, you don't have to bring anything, a package solution, everything is included. So this is actually a very good model because it speaks to the imagination, right? So this is what we're doing. Okay, why? So wh why would you do cloud? Because uh, sure, Amazon grows, Microsoft grows, why, why would you really do cloud? Uh, and, and to answer that question, you almost need to answer, why would we not do cloud? Because uh, talking to clients about cloud, I hear so many excuses on why we cannot do cloud, and this is just a subset of excuses that I hear. Compliancy, we can go to the cloud because we have compliancy issues. Yeah, in some cases that is still true. In most cases that is actually not true anymore. Can you put HIPAA in the cloud? Absolutely. Can you put uh, PII and PCI in the cloud? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, Microsoft and Amazon have a federal government cloud offering. It's FedRAMP certified, IRS 1075. All the certifications are there. So really compliance is not that much of an excuse anymore. Sorry, we're going to scratch it off the list. Security. We talk about security a lot with our clients. Oh, it's not secure and I'm afraid to put things in the cloud. And the first question that I always ask is, that, okay, how do you do your payroll? So oh, we don't do our payroll. We outsource that to ADP. Guess what ADP does with your payroll? They put it in the cloud. Guess what's in your payroll? Social security numbers addresses, names, everything that PII is, everything that you're trying to protect in the cloud or in your own data center. So that excuse is not there anymore either. Plus, sure, you, you cannot mess up, right? I mean, if you bring things to the cloud and you mess it up, you mess it up big because it's accessible to everyone. But the cloud providers, they spend way more in security than any one of my clients, way more. Microsoft secure, Amazon secure. You never hear that those guys got hacked. You sometimes hear that Amazon went down for a couple hours, but they don't get hacked. It's not an excuse anymore either. 
cost, it's expensive. We did the math, it's more expensive. Yeah. If you grab your data center, you just lift and shift that entirely to the cloud, you're going to pay a little bit more because it's a pay-as-you-go model, right? So you, when a server is up and you use compute, when you use storage, you pay for cloud services. But the nice thing is in your data center, if you turn it off, you still have to pay for the server. You still have to pay for the floor space. And in the cloud, the cost goes away completely. Uh, business case here is, I'm relating it to pizza again, because I think that was a good, good analogy. Uh, large pizza provider actually has a hybrid infrastructure where they're using cloud computing for days where it's extra busy. So they have an own, their own data center. And on Tuesday night, they could probably handle all the orders that come in online in their own data center. Uh, as it ramps up through the week, they probably go to the cloud a little bit. They need some extra performance and capacity. Uh, but there's one day a year when they need so much capacity that they could never build enough data center space to host that capacity. Super Bowl, Super Bowl Sunday. Everybody wants to order pizza and wings. They scale up in the cloud, pay a massive amount to Microsoft. This is on Microsoft Azure for Super Bowl Sunday. But guess what? Super Bowl's over and they go back to their lean and mean own on-prem data center. Perfect business case. Scalability, flexibility, elasticity. This is how you use cloud computing. So cost, no, it's something else. It's really, it's really a lot cheaper. Uh, my clients do have a lot of uh, problems with analysis paralysis. Oh, we looked at it and we looked at it again and we looked at it another time. Okay. With cloud, you truly, you just need to take a plunge. I mean, dip your toe in the water, try it. Grab an application that is not doing much or it's not very business critical and gain some expertise and experience in your organization. You should dabble in this. If you don't, guess what? The competitors are doing it and you're gonna lose to them at some point. Uh, control, and this uh, is actually something that's our fault as ITS professionals. Because we like stuff, we like hardware. We wanna have control. We wanna be able to walk up to that server and grab it and hug it and it's our baby, but you, you need to give it up. I mean, the infrastructure of the future is code. Infrastructure of the future is not hardware. And we need to realize that first, because that's the only way that we can help our clients. If we hold on to this stuff and are preventers of information technology, it's not gonna end well. And ultimately, if it ain't broke, it ain't fi don't fix it, sure. Uh, if we uh, had that mindset, we would all still be watching black and white TVs because they were not broken, it was all fine. You need to move on, truly need to move on to the next phase. All excuses, we scratch them all off. Uh, there is one reason, and I say good with a question mark, to not do cloud and that's if you still have one of those, a mainframe. And they look a little more modern nowadays, but the fact that I was able to find this picture shows you how old this technology is, right? So uh, if you still have a mainframe, you cannot do that in the cloud, not really. I mean, IBM says that they have something, there's a little service offering, you can do some soft layer and other things, but not really. Uh, but then my next question is, why do you need a mainframe? Do you truly need a mainframe? Or is it just too expensive to get rid of it? Or because you gotta migrate away from it, but you gotta bite the bullet at some point. Uh, look at an organization like Netflix. Do you think Netflix has a mainframe? They don't have a mainframe. They have 93 million users worldwide. 93 million. And where do you find mainframes? Banks, insurance companies. Do you think they have 93 million clients? Maybe very large ones do, but Honestly, mostly not. This is 93 million users with terabytes up on terabytes of data, all cloud-based. Netflix is a very big AWS client. So uh, when there's an outage with AWS and it happens, I think, once or twice, sometimes Netflix is a little flaky. And that's hard because we all want to see Fuller House, right? So. So you gotta embrace it. You truly have to embrace the cloud. And these are some reasons on why you wanna embrace the cloud. First of all, 100% new infrastructure, all the time. If you buy a server in your data center, you're writing that thing off over four years, three years, five years, whatever it is, 
guess what? Two years from now, that thing is old. It's slow. You gotta buy, buy more stuff to make sure you keep up with performance. In the clouds, you don't care. You just don't care. You scale up, you scale down. Always new hardware, always. Redundancy is built in. If you do Azure, Azure has 38 regions across the world. You can just say, okay, I wanna put it here and here and here. You can select a couple data centers. You can say, I want it just within the continental US. I want it in Asia. I, you can do it anywhere. You just select it and everything's replicated and everything works wherever you are in the world. Instant redundancy. And you don't believe how much, how much our clients spend on DR capabilities. It's very expensive and very tough to manage. It's speed, it's agility, it's the integration. And, and this is really where you, where you have the, the business case to do cloud. If you don't do cloud, you are missing out on that agility as an organization. And this really ties into digital disruption, what it says there as well. So we see some digital disruption. We see some companies that are born on the internet, never ever owned a data center. They might have a server closet to host some VPN or to do some things. They don't even have a data center. Look at WhatsApp. Uh, and, and here in the, in the US, iCloud with, with Apple. I mean, they totally disrupted the mobile market by making text messaging free, completely free. And it's not that long ago when you went for a mobile plan, they said, we'll give you 100 text messages for free. And you said, wow, this is a great deal. Okay, you, you get 17,000 million text messages for free now. You can do it all night long, all free, disrupting a market. And this is happening more and more. There are companies today that are not gonna be around in five years or in 10 years because they're not keeping up with all this stuff. Very important to keep up because you're losing the battle. Someone can come in, start a business and just rob your market share. Could happen today. So if you don't have the speed and agility to respond and react, or you don't have the cash to buy them. I mean, we had insurance, for instance. We at the commercials from insurance, and they were bought by a larger insurance company. Why? Because it was kind of a threat. They had a very lean business model, born online, born on the internet, it happens. And then ultimately cost saving, there definitely are cost savings. Uh, but are there? Yeah, there are. Uh, the cost savings are in multiple things. So Microsoft and Amazon are still making money off of this, right? So compute is not necessarily cheaper because you have to pay them and they have to make a margin out of, uh, on, on top of that. But the thing is hyperscale. This is why it's cheaper to have compute in the cloud. And hyperscale is just the volume with which these companies, so Amazon, Google, IBM, but with which they build data centers. Uh, I was in uh, Redmond in November of last year and they gave us a tour of a generation three data center for Microsoft. Uh, generation 3 data centers, they build pods, they call them pods. And every pod has its own power, every pod has the storage and the compute. And they, every time they expand, they do an extra pod, and another pod, and another pod. Uh, so our clients maybe sometimes buy 10, 20, 50, 100 servers. One of these pods is 1,000 servers. 1,000 servers, 20 racks. Every Rex has 48 terabytes of disk, disk space. I mean, it's ridiculous. No client can buy that stuff. And they're building these things on and on and on and on. If you look at what Microsoft is doing in government cloud, they have uh, large data centers on the border of Virginia and, and uh, North Carolina. Uh, and they have a huge, huge map there. And why did they choose there? They could have multiple grids there coming in from multiple locations for power and they're just excavating and building extra data centers. They have a generation one, two, three, and four data centers sitting there. And the later generation data centers, they don't even cool them anymore. There is no cooling in these data centers. And cooling is a huge expense for our clients, right? Because we need to cool this stuff. Microsoft doesn't care, they don't cool it. Hot, humid air from Virginia, North Carolina, and they just blow it through their data center. And one, two, three, five, 10 degrees. Uh, We'll take it, we'll just create draft and, and it'll take some of the heat off. And guess what, if one of the servers dies, they don't care. They don't do maintenance on a pod. They do maintenance on a pod every other month. And if a server dies, we'll just let it sit. And another one dies, we'll let it sit. 
and they don't do maintenance until either the time frame of the two months is there or a pod is at 70% capacity. I mean, if a server dies in the data center of one of our clients, an alarm goes off, someone runs in and tries to fix this thing. These are huge, huge cost savings, and that's why it makes sense. What we've seen over the last couple of years is that the cost of compute in the cloud has significantly reduced. And, and Business Magazine calls it the race to zero. It's almost the race to zero. I mean, what we're going to see at some point is cloud computing is free as long as you use my licenses. And, and Amazon has the, the model flipped around, right? So they say, hey, you've got to pay for my compute, but you don't have to pay licenses. Aurora, the database platform, is free. You can get a database for free. Or you can pay thousands of dollars to Oracle. Maintenance on top of it, and why would you? So companies like that really have to come up with a new business model as well. Total disruption of what is happening, total disruption of the price point of compute. Also, if you have your own data center, you buy a server today, you are locked in for the cost over the write-off period. In the cloud, your cost goes down every year. It actually goes down every week, every month. So there's, there's definitely a case to be made for, for cost savings. And it's just, it's proof. Companies also change their strategy uh, based on cloud computing. And there's a, a very good quote here uh, from Jeff Immelt, who is the chairman and, and uh, CEO of General Electric. And he said, if you go to bed one night as an industrial company, you're going to wake up the next morning as a software and analytics company. Uh, he said this in 2014. It's 2017 today. They don't want to be a dusty, old-fashioned, gray manufacturer anymore. They want to be a digital company. GE is going digital. And GE is one of our larger clients. We have a big partnership with GE. Uh, we, every year we present on AWS reInvent, which is their annual conference, uh, always in Vegas. Nice to be there too. Uh, and uh, we have already lifted and shifted more than a thousand applications for GE to the cloud. More than a thousand. I mean, the scale is, is just ridiculous. So, because they want to be a digital company, they want to be nimble. Okay, then finally, how? How cloud? And we can talk the rest of the week about this, and probably even longer. So this is, this is really hard to answer, how cloud? But you start here. You start with a cloud-first strategy. It is the new normal. I mean, cloud, honestly, is nothing more than a building block in your enterprise architecture. And you just use it whenever you need it, whenever you want it, whenever it is feasible for the functionality that you need. But a cloud-first strategy is where it starts. And the next thing you do then is a roadmap. Because we understand, I mean, if you talk about born on the internet clients, it's, it's much easier, right? I mean, if you don't have a data center, you're not locked in. Many clients bought a data center and they're writing it off over 15 years. And they're only in year five. They still have 10 years left. It's painful. Who made the decision? Fire him. Doesn't matter, you're still in the data center. Slowly moving to cloud, doing a hybrid model, road mapping it, but you gotta have a plan. If you have a plan for your IT infrastructure and it does not include cloud, you're failing. You're missing the point of what's happening in the world today. So we help our clients there. We have a solution offering called Cloud Choice. Uh, we have AAA there, uh, Advice, Align, Animate, where we help our clients with the, the strategy and road mapping and assessments. What, what applications can you move to the cloud? What is impossible? what needs some rework, what is a good candidate for software as a service or platform as a service, those kinds of things. We also do a line where we actually, where the, the rubber hits the road and we truly are migrating and lifting and shifting stuff. So that's the, the whole GE story, moving those applications out and ultimately managing it because managing things in the cloud world is a little different. I mean, I already told you it's pay as you go. Uh, Microsoft does not offer an option to easily turn it off got to go in the Azure portal and spin it down. I mean, if you have compute, that's how they make their money. So we help them with managing that. Uh, we have managed services and help them on an ongoing basis. Uh, we also have a lot of thought leadership, and this is also stuff that we bring to our clients. We've actually written a couple of books about this. Uh, collaboration in the cloud, and, and that's kind of in the begin days of Office 365, the Microsoft offering. 
How do you truly set up a digital enterprise, digital transformation, collaboration? And then a book, Seize the Cloud, the title of the presentation today. Because you've got to seize it, you've got to grab it. You truly got to embrace this thing because it's here to stay. And we help our clients in that space. Okay, let's go into some questions. Sure. So very interesting question. Are there any legal implications from a Ford Amendment perspective uh, for clients? That, so who owns the data? Uh, and, and, and also what, what can happen with that data? Uh, so it is an issue. And, and Microsoft, for instance, they do get requests from the government sometimes to check data. Uh, what Microsoft does is that if it's a legal order, they comply with it, but they let the client know. And that is something that, that the, the Justice Department did not want. They said, no, we, we want to be able to access it. You can't tell them because we're investigating them. And Mark said, no, they trusted us. If, they, if you ask for data and we have to give it to you, we're going to tell them that you touch their data, that you own it. So, uh, but the jury's still out on that. I mean, it's, what, what you see from a legalization perspective and policies is that policy is always a couple years behind the technology, right? It is so hard to keep up because this stuff keeps moving so fast. So it'll, it'll take a while. Uh, it, and, and by that time, technology is going to be a lot further again. So uh, one second, I have another question here. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yeah, the, uh, the, your, your, your slide that had the race to zero there, <coughs> the race to zero is for the cloud provider and their technology mm -hmm. platform. If I'm buying cloud services, don't I get locked in <coughs> at a rate that doesn't then reflect that race, race to zero? So, very good question. So, the race to zero, if you buy cloud services, don't you buy in into a certain rate? Uh, this is actually flexible. So, it depends on what contract you have. Uh, uh, with Microsoft, you typically have an enterprise agreement, and in that enterprise agreement, you lock in a certain cost. And they give you a, a pretty steep discount when you have a very large enterprise agreement. Uh, but then when you have your true up and prices are new, you just renegotiate. And that's what happens with our, with our clients all the time. They truly have seen the cost of compute go down even though they have existing contracts. Because if not, you pick up your business and you go to someone else. And this is also why we see most of our clients, especially the larger ones, have at least a multi-vendor strategy. They go to two cloud providers. And if one doesn't want to lower the cost, guess what? We're not migrating any of our stuff to you anymore. Even if I'm locked into your platform, which, which could happen. I mean, I'm doing Aurora on AWS, but I can't do Aurora on, on Azure. So, hey, I'm locked in here, but guess what? This other application is going to Microsoft, and another one, and another one. So there's always that peer pressure where cl that clients are in the driver's seat and can leverage these two companies. So, but great question. One sec. Go ahead. Not a, not a question, but a comment on the question earlier around the, the data. So we're seeing solutions for that. They're called cloud access security brokers, PASBs, where you can actually control your data. You have the keys to your data, and even though it's a third party that, that is hosting your data, they can't even access it because you hold the encryption key on it. So there are solutions that are starting to come sure. to help with that problem. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Appreciate it. Go ahead. What about uh, moving FTI data to the cloud, federal tax information data? Mm -hmm. Have you had any experiences with that? Yeah, it's not, that? it's not a problem. So actually, so I already mentioned Azure, IRS 1075 compliant. Yeah. Uh, you can do it. Uh, data has to be encrypted in transport and in steady state. Uh, that's what it has. So yeah, there's no issues there. Yeah. Good question. I have one in the back. With AWS controlling 50% of the, the market right mm -hmm. now, they are not, uh, because like, so the question is, is with AWS having 50% of the market, are they controlling the price point? They are actually not, and the reason for that is, I mean, Azure grew 100% last year, right? So you have options. So uh, of course they look at each other, they wanna be competitive and still make money, but I mean, this is a race to zero. It's not gonna be completely zero probably, but yeah, there's no one controlling the price. Yeah. But good question. 
Go ahead, sir. Uh, with the market share of AWS and Microsoft, any predictions on the future of regional co-location facilities? Three or four locations, CoLogix, Expedia, Yes. So the qu the question is with with the size of these these massive giants. What about what about colo? So co-location providers. Uh, there's still a business case for that sometimes, but it's going to be more expensive. Colo is more expensive than cloud, but colo might be a business case in your situation that you you need to go to. I mean, your applications aren't cloud ready, but you have a leaking data center and you need to get out of that. Okay, you do colo. And in our book, Seize the Cloud, we actually describe one of those scenarios where a client was in a situation to, they actually had to build a data center because they didn't have capacity anymore. They couldn't go to cloud because of compliance, regulation, and just comfort. So they did colo, but with the full intent to go to the cloud. What we see with co-location providers now is that they're trying to, I mean, they're rebranding themselves, right? They're becoming cloud providers, Rackspace, Rackspace is exactly what it is. It's Rackspace, it's a colo, but they brand themselves as a cloud provider. And, and that, that's why, I mean, this is the top five, but there's probably a top 50 or a top 100. I mean, there's so many flavors of cloud providers. But ultimately, uh, it, with the race to zero, it is gonna be so hard to make money on this that we probably are only gonna have like a top five or 10 left in the end. So yeah, if you're in the colo business, uh, it's, it's a difficult scenario. Go ahead. With the AWS use outage last month, I'm sure you had some clients that yeah. probably panicked a little bit. What were some of your rebuttals to CEOs who said, okay, maybe this cloud thing isn't for us? Yeah, uh, great question. So AWS had a, an outage a couple weeks back. It was a user error outage. Uh, what do CIOs and CEOs, what do they say? I mean, does that make them afraid of the cloud? Uh, it, it doesn't help, right? I mean, it definitely doesn't help. Uh, the, the cloud actually only has an SLA of three nines. And three nines, so 99.9% .9 uptime, actually means that it can be down every day for one minute and 26 seconds. That's not great, right? I mean, it might be acceptable, but it's not great. Uh, mainframe, the thing that you saw earlier, actually has nine nines. 99.99999. It's almost 100% uptime. So a mainframe actually has uh, less than a second in two years meantime between failures. So it's still a very solid platform, just very old fashioned and outdated. Uh, so clients are very concerned with these outages, uh, but on the other hand, they, they are willing to accept it because they, they have these outages in their own data centers as well. And they are usually a lot worse than what happens at AWS. The thing is AWS is going to be in the news and everybody hears about it. And if something goes wrong in your own data center, just the engineers hear about it because they got to run in with sirens on their head and everything else. So, yeah. but good question. Thank you. Okay, excellent. I think we're wrapping up then. Uh, we have uh, three minutes left before lunch, so that's perfect. We can switch rooms here. I appreciate your time and your feedback and your questions. Thank you very, very much this morning. Julio, thank you for the hospitality. And uh, I'll be around if you have any questions and we'll share the deck and everything as well. Thank you very much.